I'm very excited what we have today. We're going to start this morning with a legend, a gentleman who uh, I consider a dear friend who I've learned so much from. His name is T. Boone Pickens. <laughs> yes. Uh, he's been known as the Oil Oracle because on CNBC, I don't know what his final count was, but I think it was 21 out of 26 picks or 25 picks, he called the price of oil accurately. He's been really wonderful to us. I, I love this man because he is, I'm, many of you have met George Bush yesterday and you got a sense of what integrity he has. Uh, T. Boone has that same level of straight shooting integrity and he has ridden the, the, the wave of this business. He started with $2,500 and he built the largest independent oil and gas company in the world, Mesa Petroleum. And if you can imagine, it's 68 years old, quote, retired, and now at 87 years old, in these last 18 years, he made more money in his, quote, retirement, his new life, than he did in the previous 68 years. <laughs> just truly amazing, right? He's also just an extraordinary philanthropist. He's given over a billion dollars, just deserves an unbelievable hand for what he's done for, for different pieces of society. And so we're going to start with him this morning, and he's joining us by Skype. Boom, great to see you. Good to see you, Tony. Thank you for joining us. How's life? It's great. Are you all having fun? <laughs> We're having a great time. Listen, you wrote a book. You know, you wrote the first billion is the hardest. But one of your books was on the luckiest guy in the world. And we've talked so many times over the years, but this audience really doesn't know. Would you share why you're the luckiest guy in the world, in your opinion? And there are several reasons, but number one is I was the first cesarean birth in Oklahoma in 1928. And my dad, my dad had to talk the surgeon into doing it. My mother couldn't deliver. And, uh, and my dad talked the surgeon. He had never seen a cesarean. He lived in the town three years and they didn't have a surgeon in that town till, till 50 years later. So wouldn't you say it's pretty lucky to hit a three year old? <laughs> Like that, he, he literally, if I remember you telling me, he literally was looking at the manual, I guess, and doing the surgery on your mom, right? And he, your dad was told you might, uh, it might, you might lose his wife. He told my dad, he said, you may have the biggest decision of your life to decide who survives. And my dad said, no, no, said you're not, but an inch from that baby. And he said, uh, you can deliver. He said, well, I've got two pictures and a page and a half to go on. My dad said, you could do it. And by golly, he did it. <laughs> it's okay. That's awesome. That's I've awesome. Been, I've been lucky other, other times too. In, in <laughs> life. You said I left uh, Mesa in six, when I was 68 years old in 1996. And I have paid in taxes after I was 70, I've paid uh, $700 million uh, approximately in taxes. Uh, wow. after I left Mesa. That's and uh, was, I didn't like it when the president Obama said uh, that wealthy people weren't paying their fair share. <laughs> and I said, okay, tell me what is my fair share. So, well, yeah, yeah, almost three quarters of a billion dollars in taxes after 68. That's pretty amazing. That shows your productivity. Tell us, uh, you know, this whole group is, um, there's a, a mix of sophistication in this room. There are people very sophisticated, do huge billion dollar deals, and there are people kind of just beginning their economic journey. Tell us a little bit about your beliefs about money, because you've prospered so well, you've worked your tail off, and you've done it for decade after decade. But what are your beliefs about money you think might be different than other people's? I don't, I don't know that it is. I, I, I'm, I've struggled the last three years, and... Uh, actually uh, uh, given away more now than I'm worth. Yeah. So well, maybe you should have waited and given it when you died, but I, I wanted to give it and see uh, what happened with it. It was uh, how, whether we were successful on, and a lot of it's medical research and also a lot was given to Oklahoma State University. Yes. And, but I, I feel like I got my money's worth. Yeah, that's true. Well, you well, you gave what seven hundred million dollars to your to your alma mater. Is that right? No, it's a little over five hundred. Oh, five hundred million. And and he yeah. had, Boone actually gave away more than his net worth. So he gave away a billion dollars, and then things fluctuate. 
Um, but, you know, we talked the, uh, last year and you were saying that uh, you're, you're going to get that money back. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, but I haven't done it yet. And I'm <laughs> 87. You're running out of time. But I, I was with my doctor yesterday and he said, well, you, you're going to live to be 110. So well, we're thrilled about that, Boone. <laughs> That's awesome. You know. The financial world is uh, such an interesting world where integrity doesn't seem to be a very large commitment, unfortunately, a lot of the largest organizations in the world. And one of the things I've always loved about you is not only your straight shooting, but the level of integrity. Would you share with people the story you shared with me about when you were a child and you were working your paper route and you found that wallet and what you learned from that through your mom? It was my grandmother. Oh, it was your grandmother. It was my grandmother. Yes, I I had a paper route and it was, I was 12 years old. And it was the first paper route I had. It was 28 papers. And I made net a penny a day per paper. So I was making 28 cents a day. Well, that was 1940. Let me tell you, uh, 40 was, you were in the Depression at the time. and But it didn't mean anything to me because I didn't have anything to compare it to. I never missed any meals and I always had a pair of shoes. And but I made 28 cents a day. And, you know, four days, that's over a dollar. And I didn't. I didn't spend much money, and so I always had money in my pocket uh, from my first paper out. But I came in one day, and it was in the summer of uh, 1940, and and my grandmother, my aunt, and my mother were sitting on the screen-in porch at my grandmother's house. She lived next door to us. We all ate supper together at her house. Everybody had a job, thank goodness. And uh, and so anyway, I came in and I was pretty uh, pumped up because I found a wallet on my paper route and returned it to the owner. And he gave me a dollar uh, uh, for finding the wallet. And I was pretty excited because that was four days, uh, you know, income off my route, the equivalent of. And anyway, the my I, I was pretty happy about it and started telling my grandmother aunt and mother all about it and they were all shaking their head no while i was talking and i couldn't believe it and they were telling me no that's that ain't gonna work so finally when i got through my grandmother said well uh sonny said uh, you need to return the, the money to mr white i said uh, uh we're not gonna pay somebody to be honest I said, no, no, he wants me to have it. <laughs> so I, I went, I went a pitch again to him, and, and she said, no, I'll go back over there. And so it's, I got on my bike, went back, gave him the dollar, and uh, he was. He said, no, I wanted you to have it. And I said, I know, but uh, my grandmother said, we're not going to be paid to be honest. And so now it started to rain, and uh, I was – uh, you know, half a mile from home. And I started back, and when I got to Burgess Street, it was a drainage ditch for the small town I was in. Well, it was about armpit deep. And so I pushed my bicycle across, and I got home, and I looked like a drowned rat, but I wanted to because I wanted uh, my mother, grandmother, and to feel sorry for me. <laughs> it's like. <laughs> drowned going across Burgess Street and my grandmother she didn't cut any slack and she said well if you'd have gone when I told you to said you've been back for it right <laughs> so, that's, that's about how far you got with those three women they didn't when they made up their mind they meant it <laughs> that's beautiful tell me something you know you started your company with twenty five hundred dollars how did you build Mesa Petroleum into the largest independent oil and gas firm in the, in the world? Well, you say in the world, it, it was, uh, there, there weren't any independent oil companies around the world. They were mostly all in the United States. And it was, that was in a period that, that you know, I had a lot of good things happen. I made an acquisition of a company, huge in production company, which had uh, three trillion cubic feet of gas. And it was, uh, I, I had some real breaks at that time, and, and it worked out that way. Uh, Mesa later uh, had tough going. 
that we made that acquisition in 1969, and then we merged with uh, a company, Parker Parsley, in 1996 when I was 68 years old, and that company now is Pioneer Natural Resources, right. and which is a big oil company. Right. Tell me, um, you know, you look at the world today, you care so much about this country, and you created the Pickens Plan. I remember years ago when we first started spending a little time with you, you'd spend $100 million to help promote alternative forms of fuel to help us get off the dependency on the Middle East. At that time, I don't know, it was $10 trillion. I don't know what the number was. Tell me how you feel today about how things have changed because of technology and the amount of natural gas and oil that we have available that now seems to supersede what they even see in Saudi Arabia. Where are we today versus then? And where are you and your version of the Pickens plan and looking at alternative energy or promoting it? Well, we, uh, I feel like we were successful, but not completely, because I would have liked to have had an energy plan for the country. And we almost got it passed. We missed by uh, three votes in the Senate. Yes. And, and it was, but uh, a lot, uh, they're a lot better informed about natural gas today than they were at that time. So uh, we, you know, I feel like we, uh, again, we didn't get exactly what we wanted, but we made real progress. But the United States has natural gas, which is, uh, you know, 80 times cleaner than oil. And it is, we have natural gas for over a hundred years. And so all that happened after I was working on the Pickens plant. I didn't cause it to happen, but it was kind of coincident with uh, the plan I was selling to trying to sell to uh, Congress, yes. but it's, uh, uh, you know, uh, America today. I mean, we were, like you say, we were, we were <laughs> really spending a lot of money on foreign oil. We were importing, uh, at that time from the mid East, about 7 million barrels today, we import from the mid East a little over 1 million barrels. So, That's amazing. uh, it is amazing. And, and we, Today, we, uh, we, our, our production in the United States, oil production, had declined from 1970, 10 million barrels a day. We had declined to 4 million. Then, due to horizontal drilling and fracking, we brought production back up to 9.7 million a day. Okay. And that was a huge difference. We still were the biggest user of oil in the world. We're using 20 million barrels a day. And we're importing uh, a little over half of it. But uh, the biggest part of our imports come from uh, Canada and some from Mexico. So those are neighboring countries much better than bringing it from the Mideast. For sure. What a difference. You, you once said to me, you said that you were made to make money and to generously share it. Where did that belief come from? I don't know. I, I, I like to I like to make money. And I like to give it away. And I, you know, I, I, MD Anderson Hospital, uh, you know, the number one cancer hospital in the world. Uh, I've been a, 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 a my gift there was fifty million dollars. Yes. And I went Salvation Medical here in Dallas. I gave fifty million to that. Uh, that those are both institutions of the University of Texas. And I didn't go to the University of Texas. In fact, I tried out in 1947 for a basketball scholarship. Can you believe that? Five, <laughs> nine, and one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you don't see me, me, those guys playing basketball. And, uh, but I tried out at the University of Texas. And, and then I did go to Texas A&M on a basketball scholarship in 47. I transferred to Oklahoma State the next year. But uh, I struggled to make it in college basketball. But uh, it's uh, uh, but University of Texas institutions there they have MD Anderson Hospital and Southwestern Medical. So those are uh, UT institutions. If uh, if you were back in your early twenties and you were getting in the energy business, where would you put your focus? Where would you put your investment? Where would you put your energy? Am I 20 years old in 2016? Yeah. Or taking me back when I was 20 years old? That would be. <laughs> no, 2016. In the, world, in the world we're in today, if somebody was 20 years old and they were going to put their focus or energy on building in the energy business or investing in the energy business, where would, you, where would you guide them? Where would you coach them to focus? Where well, I've spoken, 
I spoke over to SMU the other day, and I, this was, well, really, it was two years ago. But they, I was speaking to junior, senior level geologists and petroleum engineers. And I said, you students have picked the right uh, place to focus is the energy business, and you'll do well. Uh, if I was over here today, would I say the same thing? Is that, I think that's kind of the question. <laughs> would talking to, you know, uh, students uh, over there were 22 years old, and would I say you have made the right choice? Uh, I would. I'd say you made the right choice, but bear in mind, since 1980, five times the price of oil has been cut in half. Wow. So this isn't something that I have. It's not my first rodeo. <laughs> I mean, I've seen this before, and oil price will come back, and uh, you will have demand will continue to go up. Is what's going to happen. You're going to use fossil fuels uh, for the next fifty to hundred years. Wow. And I'll probably be wrong on that statement, but I won't be around for you to say to me, you know, you're wrong. <laughs> but we're going to, when you're using 95 million barrels a day for the world and 70% of that's going to transportation fuel, then you're going to be using gasoline, diesel, natural gas, and you'll use a battery. And uh, somebody said the other day, well, hydrogen, I think hydrogen's a little far out. But all those are used for transportation fuel. The only two that will move an 18-wheeler is diesel and natural gas. Gasoline, ethanol, um, they, they, won't, they won't do it. Battery, you can't move an 18-wheeler on a battery. And uh, so there's a lot of things that are going to be solved, but they, you are, energy is going to be huge, and it's getting bigger all the time. But we're going to use more wind. We'll use solar. All those, I, I'm for any form of energy. I don't care what it is. And I'm not a guy that's against coal. Uh, I think you're going to use coal, too. Hmm. Other questions from the audience? Yes. Mr. Pickens, thank you so much for joining us. Who were your influencers or mentors in business? Well, you know, when I got out of school, I was a geologist. So I was headed for the oil industry. And my father had been in, was in the oil industry at that time. He worked for a company, Phillips Petroleum, which is now ConocoPhillips. And so, and I worked for Phillips when I got out of school. So I, I got a good education. I was, I was a hard worker and I worked for a good company and consequently I was well trained and, and from there, uh, but I, mentors came to me more by reading and, and watching what went on in the oil industry. I was not watching other industries. I mean, if you today want to talk to me about Amazon or, or, uh, tech companies, I, I, the conversation would be very brief because you'd run out of my, my knowledge in just a few minutes. I, I haven't focused on that, but I can talk to the oil industry, gas, natural gas, and, and energy. I can talk to you all night about it if you want to do that. But where were my mentors? They were, I, you know, they were people that were running those companies. I watched how they operated and, and learned a lot just by, by the performance of, of those companies. That's beautiful. Uh, one more question. You've been addicted to fitness. Yeah, I think it was, if I remember right, 1979, you built the first really huge corporate fitness center for your employees. We had about 30,000 square foot place you built. Are you still focused on fitness in your life, even at this stage of life? I've got the same trainer for 27 years. Wow. And I've, I've worked out four days this week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. I work out at 6.30 in the morning. And there's no question at 87 years old that my fitness routine has been a real asset to me. But uh, uh, Tuesday of this week, I did legs and I did 300 yards of lunges. Wow. And 
Jesus. Yeah. That's incredible. I did. I did it in three sets of 100 yards each time. Today, I did, uh, I did uh, squats on the ball, and I did uh, 200 uh, squats in four sets, so oh, 50. God. That's incredible. Wow. wow. I, I don't have any soreness in my legs. My legs get tired, but no soreness. And I did the treadmill uh, every morning. At uh, uh, I now do 12 degrees and speed uh, 3.7. And uh, I, I don't do – my wife is on there. <laughs> she goes, She gets on at 5.30 in the morning. I get on at 6.30. She goes one hour, four miles at 10 degrees. Wow. So – and so she she works out hard. I do too, but I know this. So I said, "Well, you're a fitness buff." No, I'm not either. I don't want to get old and feel bad. <laughs> and uh, I had I had to bury one of my friends two weeks ago, mm. and uh, so I, I want to hang around as long as I can. This is all too much fun to <laughs> you know, check out if you don't have to. <laughs> Uh, Boone, you are a national treasure. We are grateful for you. You're such an example. You're such a humble man for all that you've contributed to society. And I just want to personally thank you. And I'm going to, uh, last year, I think I told you I was donating 100, me- 100 million meals. We did 102 million meals. I'm going to do it again this year. And we're going to donate a million meals in your name tomorrow. So thank you for oh, your time right. again. I love you dearly, dear friend. Big hand for Boone Dickens. Best. Thank you. Thank you.